Welcome to Bloomer Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Apple, Tesla, and Intel driving markets higher today. Uber and Lyft shares also climbing after avoiding a planned shutdown that was supposed to happen at midnight. We will get to that in a moment. An appeals court giving them a reprieve at the very last minute. All of this on the day the Democratic nominee for president, Joe Biden, will make the speech potentially of his lifetime. The day started downbeat, though, with an unexpected rise in jobless claims. Joining us to break it all down, our markets reporter, Abigail Doolittle. And Abigail, yesterday we saw a surprise bearish reversal. Today, a surprise bullish reversal, all leading into Joe Biden's speech happening just hours from now. Walk us through the day. Well, never a dull moment, Emily, because as you were mentioning earlier in the morning, we did actually have stocks down just a little bit as that uh, initial jobless claims came back in above a million, unfortunately. But we had a turnaround. In fact, the uh, tech-heavy indexes, the NASDAQ indexes in particular, are closing up more than 1%. So perhaps some folks hoping uh, that those unfortunate job numbers could uh, force uh, Congress to approve the stimulus package sooner rather than later. Let's see. But the S&P 500 up just three-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 up 1.4%. And the mega-cap index, the New York Stock uh, Exchange Bank Index, up about 2%. So this today was all about this year's defense, those mega cap names, Apple and Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon climbing higher, the stay at home trade back in the lead, left behind small cap, the Russell 2000 down half a percent. So that's an interesting uh, way for the gains to happen, perhaps not the healthiest. Uh, lots of folks on Wall Street wanting uh, the cyclical sectors, some of the small cap stocks along with energy and financials and the industrials to pick back up. But today it was all about tech. And you were mentioning, of course, the DNC tonight and Joe Biden making potentially what will be the speech of his lifetime. Going into that, uh, many of the polls, as as you know, favor Biden to win against President Trump, including, this is not a poll, but the predicted implied probability right now going into tonight's speech has Joe Biden uh, at 59% odds of winning, implied probability of winning, President Trump at 44%. So, Abigail, given that implied probability, which has Biden in the lead, how does that potentially impact some other names? So, you know, right now we're unlikely to see all that much of an influence. We're, you know, further away. But if these expectations continue that Joe Biden uh, may become the next president of the United States, and certainly if he does win the election, there are some names that could benefit. Uh, one is Energy Transfer. This is an energy asset company. Uh, while Joe Biden himself is not particularly uh, so, so green friendly, the Democratic Party is more so. So this could be a company to benefit. And you can see, uh, in fact, that the stock down in a huge way year to date. Date, so they could certainly use a lift, those shareholders. Canopy Growth, the marijuana company, down 23% on the year. Uh, it's also thought that Democrats uh, in general, so Democratic administration, may be more favorable uh, toward the marijuana industry. And then Tesla and Nikola, the electric vehicle companies, you were mentioning Tesla above 2,000 for the first time before that five-for-one split, really pretty remarkable. The thought is also that uh, you know Joe Biden's administration could potentially be more favorable, although you could also make the case there are those stocks pricing in any sort of a democratic win hard to know sticking with the car theme though you were talking about uber and lyft this has nothing to do with do with politics or joe biden uh, but more that story that you were talking about in terms of uh, that they uh, have won the delay to convert drivers to employees buying them time to potentially campaign for a ballot measure uh, set for a statewide vote in november that would free these app-based transportation companies uh, from the sweeping requirements, of course, of Assembly Bill 5. Investors clearly liking it. These uh, companies, as you had mentioned, uh, they were shut. They were uh, planning on shutting down, which obviously would have been bad uh, for the top and bottom lines. But since uh, that is not happening, the best day in three months, Emily. Uh, indeed, for them, uh, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Thank you so much for breaking that all down. For us, speaking of Uber and Lyft, a victory, as Abigail mentioned, for both of those companies in their quest to delay converting drivers from being contractors to full-time employees. Earlier, both ride-sharing companies had planned to shut down in California at midnight. Tonight, 
Almost simultaneously, however, they won an appeal to keep operating as is until a hearing in October. In contention is a new law that requires Uber and Lyft and DoorDash to convert drivers from contractors to employees with benefits. I want to bring in Berkeley Law Professor Catherine Fisk, who specializes in labor and employment. So, Catherine, first of all, what's your take on this appeal, which, by the way, has some strings attached to it? Because the companies have to come forward with four sworn statements by the CEOs about how they intend to make this conversion ultimately. The delay is a big win for Uber and Lyft. The California Supreme Court ruled in April of 2018 that hiring entities need to treat their workforce as employees. The California legislature ruled last, voted last fall, effective January 1, companies need to treat their workforce as employees. Uber and Lyft have had over two years to figure out how to comply with the law, and they've just gotten another couple of months to try and figure it out. So what do you make of the fact that they don't seem to have given that much thought? I mean, I've heard people, critics say they're drinking their own Kool-Aid. I think they've given it a great deal of thought. Their lawyers have to have thought about it because they do not have a good argument that they are not the employers of their drivers under California law. But I think they believe that a super low cost model is their business model and treating your workforce as employees has costs. Got to pay into the unemployment insurance fund. Right. Obviously, uh, you know, there's a, an argument to be made that drivers are essential to Uber service. It's interesting um, given that this is happening in the time of a pandemic, you don't have a lot of people using Uber and Lyft anyway. So you wonder if a shutdown would have really impacted the public. Uber Eats, food delivery can continue um, at this point. Uber and Lyft are banking on Prop 22, which is going on the ballot in November, and banking on California voters to sway in their favor. They say that they uh, would like to keep them as contractors, but will pay them above minimum wage, give them more access to benefits. Do you think public opinion is going to be on their side? It's hard to know. I'm not a pollster. I can't predict that. But what I will say is that Uber and Lyft have trained the public to expect that to take a ride is a super cheap thing. And they box themselves into the corner that way by saying, well, we can't actually pay our drivers what we would have to pay them in order to ensure they get the minimum wage, in order to compensate them for the use of their cars, in order that if they are injured, they get compensation for their injuries. And so having trained the public to think that a ride in a Uber or a Lyft should be super cheap, they feel that they don't have the option to simply raise prices in order to make the cost of providing the ride reflective of the cost that they're charging the consumers. Right, especially in a pandemic when not a lot of people are, are riding anyway, unless they absolutely have to. Now, Uber and Lyft has, have set this up as a fight between the companies and politicians. They say it's politicians who want this to happen. They say drivers actually don't want to make this change, the vast majority of drivers. And speaking of politicians, earlier today we spoke with the mayor of Stockton who had something to say about this. Michael Tubbs, take a listen. I know a lot of people in, in Stockton drive Uber and Lyft as a supplement for their jobs. And I know a lot of people in Stockton who drive Uber and Lyft wish they had health care and things of that sort. So I really think it's actually symptomatic of deeper issues. The fact that we don't have a system of universal health coverage is a problem. The, the fact that we don't have um, jobs that pay wages that allow people to, to, to live with dignity is a problem. Mayor Tubbs there, part of the mayor's program put forth, by the way, by Michael Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Catherine, is there a way to compromise here? There's not an obvious way to compromise. Employers in California have to contribute to the unemployment insurance fund. 
Why? So that there will be money there for when people become unemployed. When Uber and Lyft drivers became unemployed by the thousands, what did the companies do? Tell them to apply for pandemic unemployment assistance that is funded by general tax revenues. That's asking the taxpayers to subsidize the cost of maintaining their labor force instead of having the companies bear that cost like every other company that has California employees does. And so, yes, of course, there is a compromise. One could lower the minimum wage. One could say we don't actually care about having employers contribute to the cost of health insurance. But the point is, every company that does business in California has to pay the minimum wage has to pay into unemployment insurance, has to contribute to the cost of the equipment that employees provide that enables them to do their job. What Uber and Lyft are asking for is just that the rules don't apply to them, and that's not the world we live in. If they're going to compete fairly with All other right. companies, they need to play by the rules. Well, uh, we will be watching to see how it plays out. That next hearing set for October 13th. Uh, Berkeley Law Professor Catherine Fisk, thank you so much for joining us. All right, coming up, what Joe Biden's proposed tax plan means for Silicon Valley. The Democratic nominee has set his sights on the 1% and big tech corporations like Amazon. Details next. This is Bloomberg. Joe Biden is getting his prime time moment tonight after being officially selected as the 2020 Democratic presidential nominee. Despite pledges to increase taxes for individuals and companies, the Biden campaign is still enjoying support from some of America's wealthiest political backers. Bloomberg's chief Washington correspondent Kevin Cirilli reports. Joe Biden's victory on Super Tuesday sent equity futures soaring, and his selection of Kamala Harris as his running mate also lifted stocks. Private equity donors are flocking to Biden's campaign, donating $21 million so far, while giving President Trump just $3.6 million. But parts of Biden's $3.2 trillion in policy proposals have investors worried. Biden's campaign has outlined $3.4 trillion in tax increases, funded by rolling back parts of the 2017 GOP tax reform plan. This includes a $1 trillion increase in new taxes for corporations, bringing the corporate tax rate back up to 28% from 21% as a way to provide revenue for health care, climate, infrastructure, and education policies. For individuals, Biden wants to restore the top individual tax rate to 39.6%. That's up from its current level of 37%. He also wants to impose a tax on capital gains and cap tax breaks for the wealthy at 28%. His plan also would repeal the $10,000 cap on state and local taxes, which was unpopular in many blue-leaning, high-tax states. Biden's tax plan also targets companies like Amazon through a minimum book tax, which imposes a 15% minimum tax on companies that reported more than $100 million in net income in the United States, but paid no federal taxes. Here to discuss Biden's tax plan and what it would mean for Silicon Valley is Bloomberg's tax reporter, Laura Davidson. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. So what exactly does Biden plan for Silicon Valley companies? So a couple big things is, is uh, tech companies can expect to pay higher taxes across the board, no matter where their income is or, or how they're earning it. So in the U.S., uh, you know, that, that corporate tax rate would, would go up from 21 percent to, to 28 percent. And there's also sort of this, uh, you know, additional tax that if you have a lot of uh, research and development tax credits or uh, depreciation or different things that, that tech companies, particularly Amazon and Netflix, have been really adept at using to whittle their tax bills down to, to zero – um, or in some cases getting a refund. Uh, basically, he says you can't do that anymore. You'll have to pay a 15 percent minimum tax rate on your on your U.S. profit. So that would be a, a huge change from where we are. Also, overseas profits 
right now um, you can pay, you know, as little as zero percent or, you know, in some cases you're paying like the Irish tax rate, which would be you know, 12 and a half percent. He says he would put a minimum tax there at 21 percent. So it would basically be the same as, you know, right now earning profits in the U.S. So uh, really for across the board, tech companies are going to pay significantly more on their corporate uh, on their corporate profits. So uh, compare Biden to Trump broadly. Whose taxes go up if, if Biden wins and, and who goes down? So Trump has been less specific about what he would do. Um, presumably, uh, he would keep his tax plan there. He's talked about some uh, tax uh, cuts for the middle class, as well as also providing some tax benefits for, for companies that bring uh, jobs back on shore um, and also putting tariffs on companies that, that move offshore. But really, Biden's tax plan in terms of kind of who it affects is it's corporations and those earning $400,000 or more a year. Uh, generally speaking, if you look at Mark, there's not a whole lot of tax increases. He proposes some more um, tax credit uh, tax credits there, a couple of couple tax cuts. But really, if, if you're making in that, those upper income groups, that's when you see your capital gains tax rate uh, pretty much double. You're going to see your income tax rate increase. Uh, you're going to see payroll taxes increase. It's, uh, you know, kind of it all it all kicks in at that four hundred thousand dollar level. Do you think the addition of Kamala Harris to the ticket, Kamala Harris to the ticket, has any implications given her ties to California and Silicon Valley and some big tech political backers? It certainly helps, right? You know, these lobbying efforts, you know, that they, they, they will know her staff. They will have worked with them for years. Um, and, you know, that's how Washington works. It's largely based on a uh, relationship economy. And she, she has uh, people who understand tech, who understand startups, who understand sort of how capital gains plays into how these how these companies are formed. Some of these things like stock-based compensation, which is, which is huge for tech companies, having people who are well-versed in those policies be in, in high places um, is, is always a benefit. All right, Bloomberg's Laura Davison, thank you so much for that update. And make sure to tune in to Bloomberg's live coverage of the Democratic National Convention tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Joe Biden expected to speak sometime between 10 and 11. Coming up, Alibaba's revenue growth returned to levels not seen since the pandemic. But is it enough to keep the company ahead of its competition? We discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Sales growth at Alibaba has bounced back to pre-pandemic levels. China's most valuable company reporting quarterly revenue grew a better than expected 34 percent, close to what it saw last December. The e-commerce giant benefiting from a gradual pickup in consumer spending. To discuss, we're joined by John Freeman of CFRA. So, John, are you taking this as a sign that China's economy is bouncing back and could perhaps bounce back faster than the United States? <laughs> well, um, not quite yet. Right? So, so I was I was actually surprised, um, and I and I think investors were also surprised, uh, and uh, you know, sort of impressed by the. Um, but as you can see with the reaction of the stock, you know, I think there's other issues, um, you know, that are that are uh, that are more salient right now with Alibaba. You know, uh, I think everybody understands the secular growth story for the company, um, but I think there are sort of larger macro, you know, and um, even geopolitical issues uh, that uh, that that come to bear when, you know, when when assessing the stock here. So, how do you then expect the political tensions and rising political tensions between the U.S. and China to impact Alibaba? We heard from the CEO Daniel Zhang on the call saying they're monitoring it closely, playing up how Alibaba supports U.S. businesses. Hello, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, I yes. can hear you now. John, I you were, uh, asking the you about the political. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let's talk about the political yeah, yeah, tensions so guess, between the U.S. and China. How do you expect that to impact yeah. Alibaba and the Chinese economy in general? We heard from the CEO who played up the fact yeah. that Alibaba supports U.S. businesses and said it's something that they're monitoring closely. Right, right. No, and and and, and I think he's I think he's right actually there. But I think it, it doesn't really matter yet um, to some degree um, until after the election. 
You know, I think, I think I, right? So I think that, that a lot rests there because I think a Biden presidency, you know, might be, um, might still be tough on China, but it's going to be fair and not arbitrary. And, you know, I think that um, uh, uh, for, for tech, you know, for, for, for tech based uh, businesses like Alibaba, you know, I think that's, I think that's key. Um, and, you know, if, I think if, if there is a Trump victory, I think that, you know, you'll, you'll probably see, and I think everybody here, you know, in the, in the DC area where I'm, you know, where I, where I, uh, where I, I grew up and, and, and now live, you know, I, I have friends in the lobby in, in the lobbyist world and the political world. It's hard not to, and they are all basically saying, you know, that, that you know, uh, a, 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 that it's, it's a, a Trump victory would be great for resource-based, you know, stocks and so forth. But you know, it's really going to hit China trade, and if it hits China trade, I, I don't, you know, I think it's hard for Alibaba to sort of escape that. Um, but I think in addition to that, in addition to our own election, I think, you know, I think there are macro, maybe slightly longer term, you know, macroeconomic risks um, and uh, that, that, are, that are tied to um, what people see as an erosion, you know, as, as an erosion in the, the rule of law, which is really the foundation, you know, of, of um, uh, uh, particularly of tech-based businesses. You know where uh, you know a lot of the, the you know, it's not physical uh, it's not physical goods that you're moving back and forth, right? It's it, it, you know uh, it's fulfillment, and you know it's a, it's a, Alibaba is, it's a, is a tech company. It's a software company that uses its software, right, to facilitate uh, you know uh, uh, e-commerce. And I, I just think that you know I think uh, I think what you're seeing with the stock is, is kind of ca- you know is, is, is caution, even though that the the, the beat was was so impressive. I mean, uh, particularly cloud computing, for example, you know, recelerating to fifty, not uh, you know, fifty-eight to nine percent growth. Um, that was you know well uh, above what what we expected. We you know, we expected a you know a pretty significant uh, deceleration. And so I don't know if you on that balance, right? When you balance that all out, all right. um, I think uh, yeah, that's where the stock is. Right? I think it's gonna. I think it may, it'll likely trade sideways for a while. Okay. Okay. All right. John Freeman of CFRA. Thanks so much, John, for weighing in. Obviously, we're going to continue to follow, especially in the midst of uh, potential trade talks. All right. Coming up, Airbnb filing confidentially to go public. Also announcing a cap on the number of guests at rentals. All the details next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Airbnb announced a cap on parties and events listed on its platform in a bid to comply with COVID-19 health protocols. The ban applies to future bookings and limits occupancy to 16 people and will remain in effect indefinitely. This just one day after the home sharing company filed confidentially to go public. To discuss, we're joined by Bloomberg's Crystal Z. So, Crystal, let's talk about this ban, obviously, you know, Airbnb has been going through a tough time. Travel has come to a standstill, standstill was somewhat rebounding. And now this new cap on gatherings. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, like you said, they've capped the uh, occupancy to 16. And this is a global wide ban. And they have been tackling this issue for, for a long time. Like, we remember that uh, shooting in California on a Halloween party. So they really have been trying to crack down on parties on at the listing properties. Um, this is obviously, we can see as a move to clean up, you know, whatever scandals and to, to, to clean up before they go public. Um, they filed on Wednesday a statement that says they would, uh, they have filed an S1 to go public, which is one of the most long-awaited listings. Um, so, so that is an interesting timing for these both announcements to come like almost simultaneously. 
Are there any instances or stories of COVID outbreaks from Airbnb stays in particular? Yeah, I don't think that we have actually that addressed that issue, but 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 the impact of COVID on Airbnb's business has been reported and talked about very, very many times. Um, they have seen some recovery in June, as Bloomberg has reported. Um, the bookings has is only down 30 percent from 2019, given nobody is traveling. That is somewhat a positive sign. Uh, and from May, on a year-to-year -year basis, it's down 70 percent. So we've seen the rebound in June. Um, so, so, so COVID's impact is there, but they have been improving. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, there, there has the second quarter revenue has fell 335 million. Um, so, so some people see it as a sign that because of the stolen revenue, they can no longer do a direct listing, which does not allow them to raise capital. And this listing event will more, more likely be an initial public offering, so they can, you know, they can get some money for for the business. So the question is, how will investors look at this and how will this uh, new ban actually impact the business when it was starting to come around? And what does that mean for a potential IPO? With or without the ban, it's it's a very difficult valuation exercise for investors. They raised a debt deal in earlier this year and that valued them at 18 billion versus 31 billion previously. So whatever number that is going to appear on the IPO or the, or the listing is going to be interesting for everybody. It's going to be a difficult exercise. Nobody's going to know how they're going to be valued, especially when the pandemic seems to have uh, an unexpected impact and rebounding. It's a questionable uh, depending on, you know, the next, the, the coming, uh, where, the, where the pandemic hits. Uh, so, so, so that, I mean, with or without the, 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 the party ban, would be difficult, but but I think it's very interesting to see to see the sign of recovery. All right, and all right, uh, Bloomberg's Crystal Z. Thank you so much. We're going to keep following, obviously Airbnb on its road to uh, potentially an IPO. Thank you so much. All right. Well, the legacy industrial company Honeywell initially focused on making N95 masks and ventilators when the pandemic hit. Now it is shifting gears to help schools and offices and stadiums reopen safely, even airlines. Meantime, the company is also marking its 100th anniversary of being publicly traded. In the second part of my conversation with Honeywell CEO Darius Adamchek, I asked about their latest COVID efforts and how their legacy will evolve. We're in a couple of end markets that are, that are challenged, you know, aerospace being at the top of the list. But, you know, we've quickly pivoted. I mean, this is the proverbial making lemon out of lemonade. We've really quickly innovated to create new solutions for the world that are needed now instead of some that are going to be needed later. You know, and some of these solutions that I talked about for airlines, for buildings, for stadiums, for remote operations, for industrial plants. Frankly, the one that we're especially excited about is we have a whole new solutions for vials. So instead of making vials out of glass, we've come up with a new materials that we already use for healthcare packaging called Aclar. It's they're lighter, they're cheaper, they're safer to use, and they're much more durable than vials. So as you can see, we've innovated literally in a matter of weeks to things that the world needs now, rather than just what our core markets needed four months ago. Back to school season is upon us and you're working with a number of universities to get them ready to resume in-person instruction. At this point, do you really think you can have in-person instruction safely? Because you know, many schools are still choosing to be remote. You know, without a vaccine, is there really any guarantee? Well, there's, there's no guarantee no matter what you do. But I think you can actually improve your odds of having a safe in-person environment by frequent testing, by making sure that students wear PPE, by me measuring temperatures. And we actually have a solution for all these things. As, as an example, we have something called the Rebellion camera, which can not only very accurately measure your body temperature, but can also, through the use of AI, check whether or not you're wearing PPE. So you can all do that without any on a remote basis. You know, it's not a manned operation. So just one example of the kinds of solutions that we're bringing to universities 
to enable them to actually do in-person classes. Honeywell has also built a quantum computer. How far along are you in terms of getting actual customers to use that technology and how much do you think that will actually play in your quest to become a more yeah. software driven company? We, we actually, it's a perfect question, uh, Emily, because we actually had a very momentous uh, event here happen in July. So we're starting to generate revenue on our quantum computer. We have one that's up and running for commercial use. We're in the process of building another one that's going to be even more advanced. So, you know, we're accelerating that journey from kind of a research and development stage to much more of a commercial stage. And, you know, we think the growth there is going to be exponential. We've had incredible customer interest in uh, using the quantum co computer to solve a number of different problems. So we think that this is, you know, this is still from a, a future, you know, this is still a few years out, but I'm excited by the fact that it's it's real, it's generating revenue, it's, well, it's happening now, and it's gonna be accelerating very quickly. You also are marking your anniversary, 100th anniversary of being a publicly traded company next month. How do you see your legacy evolving over the next 100 years, um, given the starting point you'll have for the next century, a crisis? Well, I, you know, I think a crisis is always an opportunity. I think what we've learned in this crisis, we've always been good at operating the business well, reducing costs and so on. But the new set of skills that we gain in this crisis is the ability to pivot extraordinarily quickly and focus on new business opportunities. I think that we've done that well. But I think more than anything, this next 100 years, is going to we're going to continue to evolve just like we have in the past. We're going to be continuing to be a leading technology player in the industrial world. And obviously, we're going to have a much more digital presence, not only externally in terms of our software offering, but it will becoming much, much more contemporary within our internal operations. And one of those efforts being Honeywell Digital, which is focused on our data governance, our processes, and IT standardization. And by the way, that's also enabling efficiency and speed of operations. What's your outlook on the economy? You know, how are you sort of mapping up what coming out of this actually looks like, knowing that a vaccine is, is, is still a ways off and may not be a silver bullet? We'll need more after the you know, initial round is even developed. Well, we certainly see a modest recovery. You know, we're, we're seeing that, yeah, I think Q2 was the low point, Q3 will be a little bit better, Q4 will be better in 2021. We're not necessarily planning on a V-shaped recovery. If we get one, you know, it'll be terrific because we're gonna accelerate that much further. I do think a vaccine will be a catalyst, however. A, a, hmm. a vaccine will catalyze a fat, much faster recovery, particularly in some of the markets that we play. And if you think about aerospace, there's a tremendous amount of, pent up demand to travel. I mean, I can speak personally, as soon as I can, I'm gonna be on that road for months. Um, and, and, I, and I know I'm not alone. Um, so, that, so something like a vaccine, which I don't think is that far away, I think it's you know, a few months away rather than a few years away. And I think as we get into the first part of early next year, I think we're gonna have a medical solution. That's interesting. So we've talked a lot about how working from home could change the way people work forever could put a longer term freeze on business travel. But it sounds like you want business travel or expect business travel to resume. Is that right? Well, myself, just like everybody else, I've been doing a lot more Zoom call, meeting call, et cetera, and, and touching our customers that way. And, and it's fine. I mean, it works OK, but but it doesn't um, replace an in-person meeting, an in-person meal. Uh, a discussion. You just some of that. It just can't be done through the means of uh, computer and and, and uh, video camera. I mean, it's 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 a band aid and it works, but it's not the same. And, and I can't wait to actually go and see some of the customers that we currently have. But I think there's another component that's really important, which is if we assume that most of the workforce is going to spend more time working at home than they do today, is that actually going to increase or decrease air travel? And my argument will be that it will actually increase the amount of air travel. Because mm -hmm. if you want to try to build a company culture, you can't have everybody remote and never meet each other. And, you know, when you think about things like onboarding new employees, how do you do that when they never meet any of their colleagues? How do you develop internal relationships? So, you know, if we believe that there's going to be more of a remote working relationship uh, in terms of work from home, 
I actually think that's going to improve uh, and increase the need for air travel in those events that the teams need to be brought together. And what is your plan for your own employees then? I mean, some companies have said they can work from home forever, um, but it sounds yeah. like it's not the case for Honeywell. Yeah, I mean, we're bringing back our employees to the offices when it's safe. I mean, you know, for example, in China, we're more or less fully back. Places in Europe, depending on the country, we're either partially back or fully back. In the U.S., we're watching the data like everybody else. And, and we're going to do that in phases and slowly bring back our employees. But we don't have, you know, a plan to work fully from home. We, I, we don't personally think that's as effective as having colleagues in the office to work with. Uh, but, you know, obviously in, in instances where, where it makes sense, we're going to continue to do that. But uh, you know, we don't see a long-term trend where everybody's going to be working from home. Honeywell CEO and Chair Darius Adamczyk there. Coming up, DNC Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris takes pride in her California roots. But how does Silicon Valley feel about the nomination? Will she bring the hammer down on antitrust? And privacy concerns, that is up next. This is Bloomberg. Go with what you know. That is Silicon Valley's current sentiment as the DNC officially nominated Senator Kamala Harris as the vice presidential candidate last night. Harris's nomination is seen as a bit of an olive branch for tech giants as the senator has held a largely accommodating stance on antitrust enforcement, the tech industry's primary political concern. With us now for more, Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer, who covers tech and politics for us. So, Eric, over the last few days uh, since uh, Biden picked her as his running mate, we've been trying to look more closely at her record, look more closely at her ties to uh, Silicon Valley leaders. Not necessarily a clear line, but some have given to her campaign. What actually is Silicon Valley's position on Kamala Harris? You know, I think she wasn't the favorite favorite, right? I mean, we, you look at tech rank and file, uh, you know, Bernie certainly had a lot of support and Warren. And then from the donor class, uh, Pete Buttigieg was certainly super popular. But Kamala Harris, you know, is the hometown senator, has a long track record in the Bay Area and is certainly a known entity. And given sort of the possibility that, you know, Elizabeth Warren, who's been very harsh on tech, was a contender for the VP spot, you know, Silicon Valley is certainly happy to see Harris as the pick, you know, and you've got like, venture capitalists like John Doerr, uh, the philanthropist Lorraine Powell Jobs, uh, Reed Hoffman. You know, a lot of big Silicon Valley players have donated to Senator Harris and have been supporters. What does this mean for Joe Biden's fundraising efforts? Obviously, Silicon Valley, and you mentioned uh, some of the folks who do, uh, have, have very deep pockets. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, in the first uh, 24 hours, I think nationally they raised something like $26 million. I think it's just, you know, I talked to one fundraiser who made the point that it just really gets people comfortable with the ticket. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley is full of Democrats. They're probably going to support Joe Biden. But now that it's Kamala Harris, not exactly someone who's been antagonistic to the tech industry, they can feel comfortable that writing a check, they're not working against their own sort of interests in the industry. So she hasn't been antagonistic, but she hasn't been overly friendly either. And it, it is some uh, things uh, that she will have a say on are, are kind of unclear. How do we believe or what stance do we believe she'll take on antitrust tech issues, given that we just saw the CEOs of Apple, Amazon, Google and Facebook dragged uh, before Congress? Yeah, I mean, she's difficult generally because she positions herself as unideological, which gives her a lot of room to sort of maneuver. You know, I look back in 2010 when she was just running for California Attorney General and she went to Google and talked to them, and she had a really sort of friendly tone on 
on antitrust, which is definitely the biggest sort of corporate tech issue. So, you know, she's she's positioned herself as more friendly there, but obviously things things have changed. Now she's saying that, you know, we should look into whether Facebook uh, needs some sort of breakup or punishment. So, so that's definitely a change of tone, but it's nowhere near as strong as, you know, Senator Warren, who came out with a list of tech companies she needed, she wanted to be broken up. So that that's a very different posture. I think on things like privacy, Kamala Harris is more likely to sort of be with the mainstream, which is sort of their need, Democrats think there needs to be some sort of privacy reform. And we've seen some activity from her on that. And then on AB5 with Uber, the assembly bill that we're seeing play out right now, she was she was a supporter of the bill that made Uber drivers employees. So, you know, that that's a case where she's been on the side against tech, even though her brother-in-law, Tony West, is the chief legal officer at Uber. Right. That's a very interesting uh, uh, tie there, uh, her relationship to Tony West, who runs all of Uber's legal operations. Um, OK, Eric Newcomer, thank you so much. And of course, uh, don't miss our coverage of the DNC tonight, starting 9 p.m. Eastern time. Still ahead, our exclusive conversation with the CEO of Infosys about how he is navigating tensions with China and evolving immigration policies around the world. This is Bloomberg. So today for us, Infosys is one of the largest IT outsourcing companies in the world and has seen its business battered not just by the pandemic, but by immigration policies changing in the United States, forcing the company to pivot and hire more local talent instead, rather than bringing on IT consultants from India. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde spoke with the CEO, Salil Parekh, about how he manages, manages the changing political environment. So today, for us, really, uh, our focus has been uh, in, in our businesses uh, in the U.S., which is 60% of our business, uh, our European market, which is 25% of our business, uh, and then the, the rest of the world comprising uh, different parts, with Australia being a significant part of the rest of the world. We have a small business in China where we work with Chinese private enterprises, uh, essentially companies that are growing up in this tech space, and then some global companies that operate in China. So at this stage, our business really works uh, carefully within the global guidelines, uh, government regulations, 
with supporting local businesses in their jurisdictions. Do you have any hopes for particularly perhaps here in the United States, which is such a large part of your revenue base, for what policy making could be made to sustain your business that little bit better? What would make, make doing business with the US easier, particularly for those of those employees that are here on the ground? So what I see really is, is the change in technology and the continuous change that US companies have in their mindset to leverage technology. And, and what we see more and more global companies centered in Europe doing that as well, is what's driving our business. So of course, there's other policy dimensions, but the primary activity that drives all of the change is this technology innovation. Our digital business today uh, in the first quarter grew at 25%. Uh, and we think that's really where the greatest impact is. Uh, the work that we do on the cloud, in cybersecurity, on IoT, th these are the types of changes that we benefit from the U.S. Of course, there are other dimensions, uh, as you referenced, uh, on policy, but they don't have the biggest impact today because of the technology drivers. And talk about how you've seen perhaps your role as a technology leader change within the COVID pandemic. Uh, there's news, of course, that you've been almost sort of embracing public-private partnerships here in the United States to help launch contract, contact tracing applications, for example. Is that something that you see yourself doing more of? So there, you know, we've offered up our technology platform and capability uh, to some of the uh, uh, states that we are working closely with uh, to make sure that if they want to launch any of these within their support, their tracking, their handling of the COVID response, we, we are there for them. And one of those examples was in Rhode Island, where we worked closely with the governor and ensured that our technology platform was leveraged as they saw fit to make sure that they could address the needs of handling COVID within the state. So we are ready for that. We're working with other states uh, in, in the US and actually across other jurisdictions as well. We've done quite a bit of work in supporting the communities uh, in uh, India, uh, in the UK, and we're starting to do more of this across Asia Pacific as well. The CEO of Infosys there with Caroline Hyde. And it is Joe Biden's big night. He's scheduled to speak tonight sometime between 10 and 11 p.m. Eastern time. Do not miss Bloomberg's live coverage of the Democratic National Convention starting at 9 p.m. Eastern. We will be all across the convention. That's all for Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.